the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And often, as I say around here, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. So praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Milt. Thank you, praise team. What a joy. Thank you for getting us ready for Easter next week. You ought to be ready and ready to go. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Uh, great, great time of singing as always. And thank you. Yes, the, the choir has been uh, singing, practicing, singing, practicing, practicing, singing. And uh, everything's all set up, ready to go. And uh, as Milt said, they'll find a spot for him up here somewhere. There'll, there'll be a number of people up here singing. Um, it's great. Uh, and I won't take away the surprise, but there'll be lots of people standing up here next week. Uh, I mentioned in the email I sent out on Friday, if there's a time where you have been you know, wondering, when can I just invite someone? People are open right now to come to uh, a church that celebrates Jesus, celebrates God. Maybe even they're just inquisitive and wondering and, and maybe their, their faith walk has either maybe dwindled, uh, maybe they're born again at a younger age and just not, they may be where some of the people in the church at Cor Corinth were and, and struggling, but then on the other side of it, you say, hey, there's somebody that I've been talking to about Jesus and the reason why I live like I live. Next Sunday, they will hear the message of Jesus Christ come shining through for 45 minutes of singing. And it'll be beautiful. It'll be a sweet time. It'll be a privilege for a preacher to be able to come up behind that for just a few minutes and just share the word of truth. And uh, by the way, you're in chapter number 14. Well, the first three verses, four verses of chapter Number 15 will be very simply where we speak next week, and we might even uh, uh, capture a little bit of verse number 19 that says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. There you go. It speaks for itself. God's proclaiming himself through his word. Only God can do stuff like that. Which means that we have a lot of ground to cover in chapter 14 to get there. Which we will do today, okay? Last week I spoke on five verses really outlining and talking about spiritual gifts and speaking about tongues and prophesying and looked really at uh, what Paul was having to say. You think of verse number one of chapter 14, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. You think about, again, verse number, uh, verse number one of chapter 13, though I speak with tongues of angels, and I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, because guess what? I have not charity. It comes back to this love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The last verse of chapter number 12 Yet show I unto you a more excellent way. We've talked a little bit about this because chapters 12, 13, and 14 really go after some important doctrine regarding. In fact, the spiritual gift stuff, as well as it could be covered, there's other places, Ephesians and Romans, about the spiritual gifts of the church. But really, chapter number 14, God gives over to Paul by the Holy Spirit 40 verses chapter number 14 to say hey let's sort this thing out when it comes to tongues an unknown tongue and prophesying and what it means to really truly have the gift of prophecy so today if you missed last week then you're gonna well i think you can catch up all right some of the things will support and reinforce but really we're going to cover this passage of scripture in a little different way and uh, be able to move through it well and uh just Please, Lord, just direct us and lead us. And uh, as we talk about this passage, be reminded that Paul's love for this church never failed because it was God's love in him that he knew never failed. Charity never faileth. 
I know that Paul has done things, and let me just remind you of this, done things to this, uh, in this letter to this church in a way that some might see, wow, he's pretty rough. But he does it with a spirit of love when he reproved all their faults. He said, hey, you've got so many faults, and I'm going to reprove you, which means I'm going to bring them to light. He then says, hey, let me correct those faults by giving you some fixes. You need to have some fixes. This is what the Word of God does for us. And then thirdly, and I think it's probably the most important part, he says, let me show you and teach you how to have a a recovery from this falling away from Scripture, falling away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you need a recovery over your fall. So as Paul is teaching again and walking through that, as that as a preview, I want you to be reminded of what happens here in this church gathering, what he was really clearly saying in these 16 chapters of the first letter to the Corinthians about principles in the church. Last week, I spoke on principles versus or better than perversion that we need to have the principles to cover what this perversion occurred in the spiritual gifts. In fact, there are three essential principles There's many, but these three are essential that must be in practice when we gather as a church. And I said this last week up on the screen. There's, of course, edification. We want to see edification is throughout this chapter. We want to have understanding. You'll see more of it here in this passage in many of the verses that we look at today. And then, of course, order, which is how the chapter ends with how He wants the church to do all things decently and in order. Two of the pictures, excuse me, two of the principles were made clear. In verse number 26, let all things be done. How? Unto edifying. That's found in chapter 14, verse 26. Let all things be done decently in order. I just mentioned verse number 40. You see, so there are the principles there before you. But beyond the principles, there is purpose. Principles are your stated mission. There are the stated values. And they're the things that are going to really be what you're after in the church. Purposes. They would be the things that you want to go after. Their aims, their goals, their objectives, their ways to say, hey, these are our Maybe directives, our purposes of saying, okay, I have this desire to see these accomplished off of the principles that we would love to hold to from the Word of God. The purpose behind speaking prophecy then is for forth telling. Oh, did I jump ahead of myself? Oh, wait a minute, let's get the first one first. You did great, B. I jumped ahead of you. See, you're always right. The purpose behind speaking in tongues is to preach the gospel to unbelievers. We talked about that a great deal. That will come out again this week. How is it that we have people that had the capability of speaking another language? They're capable of using another way to communicate, yet they don't use it to give the gospel. By the way, we have the English language. Paul the Apostle spoke many languages. He even infers this. Today, hey, what would it be like if I could speak 10,000 words with all kinds of languages and tongues and no one understood me? He says it would be a waste. The purpose behind speaking in tongues is to preach the gospel. It says it in verse number 22. And you can see it up there on the screen, but that's the first half of verse number 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Having the ability to speak tongues, another language. If you speak tongues in a setting and there's no one to interpret it, then it is only for you. It's doing nothing for the edification of the body of Christ. It's a waste, God tells us. The purpose behind speaking prophecy is for foretelling and preaching to teach believers. You say foretelling, foretelling, synonymous. Well, they're close, but... To foretell something would be you as an Old Testament prophet telling of something that is really an illumination from God through the prophet 
to say this is something that's coming that's not written down in the word yet. So understand that that is foretelling, forthtelling. is something that's been revealed by God through his word and you are proclaiming his word. You're forthtelling something because God has said, I brought it forth in my word and you're forthtelling it. And that gift of prophecy, that gift of prophesying should be for the church, for the people. It should be at a place where it's for foretelling and preaching to teach believers. As you are having a study, I know that you're doing Daniel, a lot of that stuff comes up. It's in the word of God. But when Daniel was doing it live in front of Nebuchadnezzar of the dream, that was foretelling. You see, it wasn't written down yet. He gets a dream, he goes to God, God gives him the interpretation, and then he proclaims he's foretelling. That's prophecy that way. But forthtelling now is when Doc might be teaching it, or Steve might be teaching it, or Bobby might be teaching it in the class. It's written in the Word of God. And then you say, okay. So you're explaining things that are in the Word of God by the Holy Spirit, that is, beyond just the spirit gift of teaching, to be able to use the gift of prophesying and forth-telling according to the Word of God. Make sense? It says in the Scripture right there in verse number 22, you got the back half of it, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. People that are lost are listening to that stuff going, ah, because they don't get it. And people that are saved are getting, ah, because you haven't grown in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior. You haven't grown in the Word. So maybe you need to do that so that you can get some deeper understanding of what God's Word says. Principles and purposes. Let's pull them together very simply today with our study for a few minutes. Purposes drawn from principles. The principles are here. I spoke of principle overcoming perversion last week, as I said earlier in the first five verses. But now, purposes drawn from principles. You say you got a lot of verses to cover in a few minutes. Well, I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm just going to read a batch, a few verses, and make a point, an application of our lesson. And then we'll come back to some more scripture. And so each one of our lesson points will have just a few scripture and not read the whole thing at one time. Remember what we looked at last week. Just a, just a couple highlights. The Holy Spirit manifested these gifts in various ways. And he did it through the book of Acts as we had that accounting of Acts of the Apostles. And there was an Old Testament to New Testament transition. Some of those things went on because the Jews required a sign, but after a while you did not see some of those spiritual gifts. Remember, we covet the best Holy Spirit gifts. Remember from our first five verses in chapter number 14? But do not neglect the more excellent way. Remember, it's right here in Scripture. We just looked at seven different places that tongues is mentioned, that prophesying is mentioned, that the spiritual gifts as they come together in the passage of Scripture, letting the Bible speak for itself. Line upon line, precept upon precept, let the Bible witness itself and explain itself. So that's what we're going to do today. The first batch of verses we want to take is verses 6 down through 12. Let me read them with you, and then we'll look at our first lesson point. Follow along, verse number 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Now, he's already saying... The only reason that I'm going to speak anything with tongues is if, first of all, it has to be a prophet to you, and it's not, so guess what I'm going to speak? I'm going to speak revelation. I'm going to do it by knowledge, by prophesying, or by doctrine and question mark. Okay. Paul right now, right off the bat, is telling you real quick, hey, heads up, pay attention. In fact, use your head to think. Think a little bit here. It's all right here in your Bible. It's actually very straightforward. Man is the one who's messed up God's word for centuries. It's, it's right here. Paul's saying, hey, brethren, my brothers and sisters, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or by doctrine. Question mark. Rhetorical. The answer. Verse 7. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Simple. 
How many of you know how to play a musical instrument? Would you raise your hand, please? Very good. What does it sound like when you don't play it well? That's kind of the way prophesying and speaking in tongues when it's not for the proper usage will sound. I used to be a clarinetist. Doesn't that sound like I was famous? I was in a symphony of one in my cellar at my house at 59 Church Street, North Walpole, New Hampshire. Yes, yes, yes. I play clarinet, yeah. How many of you ever played a wind instrument? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, isn't it great? When you're going, and my mother would open up the door to the cellar. I didn't have a basement. We didn't have a basement. Cellar. Used to be a coal cellar. Used to be where they make, you know, put potatoes in the dirt, you know. I'm serious. I'm a hillbilly. What are you talking about? From New Hampshire. Mom would open the door to the basement. Mark! Concentrate! Yes, Mom. That does sound like my mother right now for a minute. <laughs> Paul's using the illustration of playing a musical instrument and not playing it right. It's the same as if you were speaking things that were not being spoken properly. Look at verse number 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? <laughs> But what if it's not played properly? What if the trumpet does not give charge? What if the trumpet doesn't tell the battalion, let's go? What if they play that horn in the Old Testament and the Jews? Woo! What if they didn't play it properly? Now they're just standing there. Same application here in the text when it comes to Paul saying, what prophet if I come in and do stuff that you cannot grasp. Verse number nine. So likewise ye accept ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. So just think about it. Every voice, every sound, everything is significant only if. Verse number 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. A barbarian doesn't make any sense but grunting and groaning. And all they are are barbarians or warriors. All they know is the language of fighting and brawling. He's saying, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. It works both ways. Verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Don't you love that statement right there? I was just going to title the message, Excel. That would have been okay, I think. I was kind of... Because he's saying... Seek, you seek, and so you're saying, okay, for as much as you're zealous of the spiritual gifts, which is wonderful, I want to be a part of the body of Christ. I'm a believer and I want to fit. He's saying, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Why would you and I go after anything that would be of ourselves and not edify the church? Because we're selfish, because we're full of ourselves. We're self-righteous, self-sufficient. We're so needy within ourselves. And instead of attaching ourselves to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God and to others in the body of Christ in order to lean on them, to have them lift us up so that we lift them up, we would rather somehow, some way, go on a quest to self-serve instead of serve others. Paul's dealing with it here in the church. So here's our simple first lesson point. When it says up there, hey, purpose is drawn from principles, it's a simple statement. It's right here, just summarizing these verses. We are not to profit self, but invoke an environment to edify others. Right? That's all. That's the pa what the passage just said. Just kind of summarized verses 6 through 12. 
See, speaking in an uninterpreted language of tongues edifies the spirit, a speaker only. Look at verse number four. Be reminded of last week. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So if we're in the church and you have the ability to speak in a language, tongues, but there's no one here to interpret, then who's the edification go to? Me. I start speaking German to impress you. What good does it do if no one's going to interpret? In fact, what he's saying is, if you have that gift, then you ought to go give the gospel to somebody. So it says up there again, it's not to profit self, but to invoke an environment to edify others. We gather together, we want to, and we want to edify others. I talked about this quite a bit last week. Again, the reiteration of verse number nine. Speaking in tongues could lead to some crazy confusion. He says, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. Don't you want to be understood? Don't you want someone who's speaking to be understandable? You want to understand them. What good is it if someone's speaking and teaching the word of God and they speak in a way that you cannot understand? And it's something that has to be learned, all of us, myself. I ask the Lord, please, would the setting of this group of people in first service, and, and there's such a wide assortment of spiritual maturity and growth, some being saved for a while, some not so, some know the word of God. God, please, I pray that your word comes across so that it's not confusing, but rather that it is for the edification of everybody. Remember the text is what he said in verse number four. Hey, if music is played improperly, it's counterproductive. Milk came up here and sung a song. He's been singing in church for 50 years, he said, give or take. Nancy was saying earlier, and she came up and told me, and she said, yeah, I started when I was a really young girl, and I said, you've probably been playing for a, about 40 years, which means you only start, you started playing in church when you were only two, because I know she's in her young 40s, and she was okay with that. But she said she's been playing music. She's an incredible pianist. You've been with her, what, 30 years? And you think about that communication unto the Lord for his glory, but also the environment to edify others. Church, First Bible, I love. I love you for many reasons, but one of them is that you go the Scripture route. You go the Holy Spirit route. You go according to what God's Word says, and you follow it. So when you have the gift of prophesying, you do it properly according to the Word of God. If you have the gift of tongues, and it ought to be taken to give the gospel, somebody go give the gospel to somebody is what paul is teaching and don't confuse people the second piece in part picks up in verse number 13 we're going to take 13 down to 20 let's read it wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown language pray that he may interpret so if you speak it then say it as a meaningful thing in interpretation right now verse 14 for if i pray in an unknown tongue my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. If that's the case, case, and you are speaking to God in the language of whatever, fine, okay, if that's really true that you have something like that, then why would you make it noisy to confuse other people? Why would you just not communicate to God? Because Paul's saying, if you are going to communicate in that way, then just, hey, it's got to be unto God. Verse number two says the same thing. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So just keep it that way, if that's the way it is. If you say that that's where you live, then that's where you live, that's fine. If that's your gift from the Spirit, fine. That's what Paul's saying here. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. It will become unfruitful to people and they will not have any understanding and now you're counterproductive to things and now you're not edifying the body of Christ. Verse number 15. What is it then? I love when Paul asks questions like that. He asks a lot of them from verses six down through nine. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. That's when it makes sense. That's why we use English words when we sing. 
What if Dwayne put up another language? You wouldn't know, what am I going to do? There's no understanding. I don't, know what I don't know what I'm singing. Have you ever been, many of you have been to a mission field and gone to different places to sing? And they might have words in Spanish up there or words in something else, and you're going, I don't know what, I'm just going to give it a try. And then I love standing next to someone who says, you know what you're singing? No, but could you tell me? And then they give me an interpretation. So the singing then becomes something I'm understanding. Is that so complicated? Only man makes it complicated when he wants attention on himself. When he wants edification of himself and not of the Lord. Verse 16, else... Paul says, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understand not what thou sayest? It's not a tough verse to understand. How can I possibly say amen, I agree with what you just said, if I don't know what you just said? Who gets glory out of that? No one. You can't give glory to God and say I agree because the person is speaking in a situation where it should be for edification, but they're speaking in a language that no one understands. Simple. Let's just put your beanies on. Let the Spirit of God, let the mind of Christ work in you, the Word of God speaking clearly. Verse 17, for though verily, excuse me, for though, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than y'all. See how I did that? You like that, y'all? I messed up last week and did the same thing. Ye... All. Okay. Two separate words, right? They're two separate words? Okay. Just checking. Verse 19. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for humbling yourself. Thank you, Paul. The guy had such a learned background. He says, I'd rather speak five words that could be understood. Verse 20, brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye, as children, be ye children, but in understanding be men. Be men when you understand. Be grown-ups when you understand. So here simply is our second lesson point, which is a summarization of that. Purposes drawn from principles. We are not to speak unfruitful words, but bring words of understanding. What fruit is comes out of someone speaking things that no one gets understanding out of. Sometimes people speak in a Bible language that someone in the room cannot even understand. They speak Bible terminology without describing it to people. That can be difficult and can be contrary. Speak a word and give an explanation. Speak a word, let the word of God explain it. Go to another verse and explain it. Let the Bible explain itself. That's what we're saying here. Who's the beneficiary of unfruitful words? Nobody. Nobody. Speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Remember we looked at, quote, angelic language, nowhere in the Bible. What is he saying then? A little bit of a sarcastic statement, but also, too, a little bit of a, hey, if I could speak as an angel to somebody, well, all you would do is speak the language that God would have you speak to the person that God is communicating his message to. If you were an angel... But I heard in Hebrews that we are better than angels, so I think that's not a bad deal. Is that crazy? Okay. Very simply, the Bible speaks for itself. Number three, lesson point. Let's pick it up in verse number 21 through 25, and then we'll capture the whole last 14 verses all together. Here we are, verses 21 through 25. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Old Testament Isaiah. He's saying, I'm going to speak to the people to know that thus saith the Lord, I said it. Remember, Jesus Christ is really truly the one communicating 
life and new life. But there was many a prophet before him who spoke, thus saith the Lord. And if they were to have the people understand it, well, <laughs> then the law as it's written, I've got to communicate it. What if God sent the law to the people, but he sent it in a language they could not understand? What good would it do? The translators give us this English version right here. The King James Bible. What if? What if we didn't have this? Then you'd have to memorize other languages. Thank you, God, that we sit in the 20, 21st century and we have the Bible perfectly preserved after all these years and saying, okay, God, we got it. We're doing it. And here's Paul saying, thus saith the Lord, because God wanted to speak to this people Verse 22 down through 25. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. We read this earlier. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, here we are, we're all together, and I'll speak with tongues, church at Corinth, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? They would. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all. This means that people are speaking the word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens to this unbeliever? Verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, not by how you said it or what you said, but that in the spirit you declared what the word of God said to this unbeliever who was lost. What happens? The secrets of his heart, the realization that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is spoken to this person. He falls on his face, it says. He will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. That's what I want people to hear when they hear the gospel preached in this church. And it has been for all these years. And I thank God. You ought to pray that God keeps it that way. You ought to pray and not take it for granted that the word of God is preached. So an unbeliever, if they come, they're going to hear the gospel. And it's going to be clear that when they come next Sunday, they're going to hear the gospel clear. That when you're sitting there right now and you may be lost... The Bible said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? An eternal damnation and condemnation because of your sin. God is holy and he cannot inhabit anything that is unholy, nor can you go into his presence with unholiness. The only thing that will make you holy and justified is Jesus Christ our Lord. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, and we will just speak of the memorial of what Jesus Christ did. His shed blood. Would you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? You are born again. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And now, you fall on your face, and you worship God as the one who is truth, because you spoke truth from his word by the Holy Spirit. No confusion. So what does the simple lesson point say? Purpose is drawn from principles. We are not to promote madness. <laughs> we don't want madness. Well, everybody's speaking all kinds of stuff. One's preaching this gospel. One's preaching that one. One's speaking in Italian. One's speaking in Sicilian. By the way, that's a bad thing, I tell you. In Cheryl's house, it's a Sicily, and then you get the Italians come over, and the, the grandpa, you know, talking about hatchet face and all these thinking murderers, and I'm going, what is he talking about? He's talking a whole different language. He's from Sicily. Grandpa Pizzo, could you just, you know, I don't understand what you're saying. I can't tell you all the words he said beyond that. Italian cuss words are not good. Just like Italian, just like English cuss words are not good. But it's a different language. And you go into that room and you might think, okay, in that house it's madness. Until you, the veal and the yonki come out. When the veal comes out, it speaks. Woo! There you go, everybody getting hungry now? Ooh. That's Josephine Pizzo Swartz making, making calmness out of chaos in her house. Here's the point. In the church it ought not to be that way. 
So, someone speaking, having the gift of prophecy, Paul's saying it's better than tongues, but I'm not saying that tongues are not necessary because the gift of tongues is to be used to reach the unbeliever. And now that's what we want to see happen. And again, I reference Randy and all the mission trips. What have you made, 25 mission trips in your life? Maybe more, give or take, with different countries and things like that. And you go, okay, I'm going to go to another country and I cannot speak English to them because they don't understand it. I need an interpreter to speak for me so that they can understand the gospel that I'm delivering. Is it any more complicated than that? No, it's not. That's what Paul's saying. This was going on in the church, though, because the Corinthian church had people from all kinds of walks of life. There are Gentiles, barbarians, there's Greeks, there's Jews, and what they've done is come into the church gathering and everybody's running their mouth about different things, and it is totally, completely confusing. But when you hear someone speak the gospel and someone understands that there's an interpretation of it, and this person that was lost becomes saved. We've now made an atmosphere for worshiping God. That's what we want to have. That's what we have. Let's protect it and keep it. Let's finish up with these last few verses, okay? Let me read them and just make an application, then we'll go into our Lord's Supper. Verse number 26 through 40. I'm just going to just read them out. I won't, uh, let's let's just read it out. Because it all fits together with the last verse. Really, it's about decently in an order. Verse number 26 says, How is it then, brethren? There's that question again. When ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. We've had that verse before, right? If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at at the most three, and that by course, by course, which order, by course, for a reason, and let one interpret. Verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Be quiet. What good is it going to do? Well, I'm going to show everybody I have the gift of tongues. So you have other languages and you're going to cause confusion. The Bible says by Paul's hand, by the Holy Spirit, hey, If any man speak in an unknown tongue and you do it two or three, that's right. But if there's no interpreter, let him speak to himself, but be silent. Verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Simply as prophecy, make sure that he's teaching the word of God properly. You surround yourself with other men of God that really know the scriptures. You hire some pastors around you that are anointed and they're blessed by God and they surround you so that they can keep you in check. There's many pastors that do things on their own and have no one else around them. And they'll say one side and say they're whining and crying because they don't have anybody to help them. But on the other side, they don't want anybody around because no one holds them accountable to the prophesying that they make every Sunday. And that is true. And churches run amok because the pastor is not held in chuck. You say, well, God must be speaking to him. Paul's saying at the church at Corinth, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Okay? Verse number 30, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. I've mentioned this before. Thank you, God, for First Bible Baptist Church. Right now, there's somebody teaching the Bible in the cafe. I've got to trust, and I believe and trust whoever it is, they're teaching the Word of God. I've got somebody, the the youth pastor is off, so somebody else is preaching and speaking the Word of God and prophesying, trusting that that person is doing it properly. In the first service at 9 a.m., Doc, were you preaching, were you teaching today? Doc's in there. I know Doc, he probably did okay. But speaking the truth, that's what it's saying. If one's there and one's there and one's there and one's there, and they're prophesying, they're doing well. And you got two pastors in the room with you, making sure that just this is to give glory to God, to edify Him, to edify the I mean, edify the people and give Him glory. Right here, 
in this audience. So we know that's what he's telling the church of Corinth, where people are going off, just doing whatever, speaking whatever, doing whatever. It speaks for itself, the word of God, does it not? Verse number 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. He's not the author of confusion, but I'm sure we are. We ought not to be, because we need to line up with God and his word. But of peace. God is not a contention confusion builder. We are. We're the ones that bring double-mindedness. We're the ones that bring double-tonguedness. We're the ones that bring confusion. We're the ones that take away the glory from God. Verse number 34 and 35, they relate to the silence that the guy who is speaking without an interpreter, but is speaking of women. Watch this, verse number 34 and 5. Remember, he's spoken of this in 1 Corinthians eleven five 5, that if a woman with a covering has the ability to pray and to speak, it's fine. Well, this goes a little bit deeper, 34, 35. They can be looked at as controversial verses, but they are not to be. It's subjection and submission. Verse 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Remember the context of the passage in this setting. There is church gatherings and there's confusion. There's church gatherings and there's contradictions. There is church gatherings, and what the Bible is saying here is that there's conflict because people are speaking whatever. And he's dealing with the idea that maybe possibly in this setting at Corinth, because he's the only place he says that, but he also says it to Timothy at the church at Ephesus. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, if you want to put that as a reference. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Because verse 35 says, And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. A woman might say, Hey, I want to learn something, but my husband doesn't know anything about the Bible, and I'd like to learn then don't shout it out and scream it in the middle of a church setting that what you know is better than somebody else what they know. Do it in decently in order. Make an appointment with the pastor and sit down if you need to have some things that you would like to speak about. Take an institute course. Take a Bible class. Gather together on Sunday mornings and go in the ministry hour. Go in the discipleship hour. Go into investors to learn more if you do not have a husband that can tell you. But here's the other side of it. You've got to believe in the context of this time that the gift of prophesying was laid on the shoulders of men at the time and is put in the place of, hey, if there's a gathering and there's all kinds of noise and everybody's speaking, what is he, why is he saying that? Well, the major responsibility for doctrinal purity in the early churches was put on the shoulders of the men, which means in the latter days here, men... We are supposed to be in a place where we communicate properly so that there is not a need to even go near that. But Paul is speaking about the setting of the church gatherings and how there's disorder, disharmony, there is contention and there's confusion. And it's so important to know that that's not the way God meant it to be. Verse 36 down through the end of the chapter. What? There he is asking that crazy question. What? What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? Hmm, are you the only one? Verse number 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet, or oh, spiritual, let him, uh, let him account, uh, acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Don't take credit for something that's of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. If you do not know something, don't speak up like you know something. Just be quiet until you learn it. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently in order. He's speaking within the church. He's speaking in the context of the passage. Very simply in summarization of that, purposes drawn from principles, we are not to create havoc, but to live life peaceably. We're to do it peaceably together with order. Would we not continue right here looking to what God says as the principle that starts everything and then lining up our purposes underneath his principles?
it's interesting that we come up with some purposes to do things that line up with our principles, and now we want to somehow, some way, ignore the Bible or say the Bible kind of says something else that it kind of says that would fit my new principles of life I have and then find purposes to support my aims and now my focuses and my purposes are built around going after principles that are not order, understanding, and edifying. Remember, you saw the word understand quite a bit, didn't you? He said it going through uh, verses number 15. 14, 15, 16, understandeth, understandeth, understandeth. Verse number 19, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Verse number 20, be not children in understanding. I need you to grow up. Be understanding as men, as maturity. That's understanding. Edifying. Is there any place where the word edify shows up? Countless times in this passage. Verse number 40, all things be done decently and in order, a summarization of multiple times that he's saying, we live life peaceably together. That's what we do. We work through the difficulties that we have, but we live peaceably together with order. We open up the scripture, that gives us order. We look in the word of God and we say, God, what does God say? You come in for counseling or come in for some, some direction or something to do. What's the word of God say? Well, I think and I maybe feel that and possibly how about if we look and say, I know what the Bible says, so I need to follow what the Bible says. The major overriding issues, as I mentioned, are these, and they're right here. They're in the Bible. Follow after charity, verse number one. Excel to the edifying of the church, verse number 12. And in understanding, be men. These overriding issues are in chapter number 14, and they stand out clearly as what we ought to do in purpose as we draw out these purposes from our principles. Church, we have some beautiful things, and I thank God for that centered up on the Word of God. As we go into the Lord's Supper, this statement for prayer comes up as we examine ourselves. Holy Spirit order directs our gifts. He directs the purpose for our gifts. The Holy Spirit will give each person, according to Scripture, what it is. You say, I don't know what mine is yet. Wait on the Lord. Also, the Word of God in His ordinances in the Word, the Lord's Supper, last week baptism, that allow, they allow for proper worship. Right now, we continue in worship. If you would, please stand. We're going to pray. And then we're going to come and grab the elements for the Lord's Supper. You notice we have a few extra chairs we're preparing for next week, but very simply... If you just come down this aisle way, I've got, by the way, two places here and two places here so that you can, two people can come up and grab them and go. Come down this aisle and go back around. Go down this aisle and come back and go back around. And that way, we can do things in order. I heard that was a good principle. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for our time and your word. And now as we walk into our time in the Lord's Supper and communing with you in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, I thank you for Jesus most of all. We're going to read a little, pray a little, and partake and remember what you, Jesus, have done for us. We're going to examine our hearts and take that time. And I just pray that as we sort through what the Word of God's taught us today, we're reminded that we gather together in this principle of edification. Let's edify one another, dear Lord. That's what I desire. We'll give you glory and honor in it as well. May we do things decently in order, and may we have an understanding of what we're really doing, partaking in the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come. And down this aisle and go.